We are going to be speaking with Tom Flanagan. Tom, are you are you out in the virtual world? Are you with us? I'm sorry, I was muted. Um, this is Tom Flanagan. Were you asking for me? I'm asking for you, Tom, yes. Okay, I'm here. Great. Well, thanks so much for uh, joining us today. We really appreciate your time um, and, and glad to have you. Uh, we're going to ask some questions and then we've got some people commenting uh, who may have questions for you. Um, but first, let's just start with uh, telling us about yourself and how your work uh, relates to cra traffic crashes. Um, so, okay, great. Thank you for um, having me this evening. And I actually represent Memorial Hermann Healthcare System. Um, I am a registered nurse um, by training and worked at the bedside as an emergency department nurse in a community hospital and then um, um, in the level one trauma center at Memorial Hermann in the Texas Medical Center. And during my tenure at Memorial Hermann TMC, I was a flight nurse on board the life flight helicopters for approximately, I flew for about 21 years, 22 years. Currently, I am the vice president of our um, system-wide trauma service line, and I am uh, the vice president of life flight operations and disaster management, forensic nursing, and transfer center um, at Memorial Hermann. So um, I've been an RN and a licensed paramedic in the state of Texas, and I have a bachelor's in nursing and a master's in organizational management. Um, so that's kind of, that's my background. Um, I still have the day-to-day -day responsibility for operations for Life Flight, um, which is based at Memorial Hermann, and we cover a 150-mile radius from the Texas Medical Center, which takes our helicopters to as far east as uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana, and as far west as Austin, and as far south as um, Corpus Christi. Um, so about a 150 mile radius from the Mex Texas Medical Center. Um, today we operate four helicopters 24-7, 365 days a year. And then we have a fifth aircraft, which is operated 12 hours a day out of the Texas Medical Center. And then we have a sixth aircraft that is based at our maintenance facility, and we put that into service when one of our other aircraft go in for maintenance, scheduled or unscheduled. Um, and the, base, the four helicopters are based in the community. One is based in Spring, Texas, at Tomb in uh, Spring and Tomball at uh, David Wayne Hooks Airport. That's our north ship. Our east ship is based at the Baytown Airport. Our south ship is based at Clover Field between Friendswood and Pearland. And um, our third ship and our fourth ship is based out in Katy at um, uh, Memorial Hermann Katy campus. And so uh, we do about uh, 35 to 3,800, it varies, flights per year by helicopter. Um, about 60% of those um, flights are what we call a scene response, where the helicopter is called directly to the scene of the crash or injury, and we airlift the patient from there to the level one trauma center. And they'll either, if they're closer to Galveston, we go into UTMB, which is a level one trauma center, or they come to Memorial Hermann, the Texas Medical Center's level one trauma center. We do not go to Ben Tob directly as Ben Tob has no helipad or heliport. So um, that's kind of the operations from that perspective. Great, thank you um, for providing that uh, information that's, that's really helpful to, to think about this component of um, traffic crashes and, and response to them. So what's the first thing that you think of when I say safe streets? Um, without crashes that are um, caused by distracted driving or intoxicated drivers um, today. <clears throat> that was, that's the first thing that comes to mind, that we've been able to get a handle on the intoxication piece and on the distraction piece. 
Okay, would uh, you mind expanding on that just a little bit? Sure. Um, a couple of years ago, we engaged with a group um, called um, uh, Safe to Save. And it's a not-for-profit group that started actually from a um, young adult that was um, hit up around College Station up near Texas A&M, was hit by a distracted driver and was killed. And uh, this group up there started this um, organization called Safe to Save. And what we did was um, there's an app that we purchased it goes on your cell phone. It's free to download. It's called Safe to Save. And what we've done is we've provided it for the Houston metropolitan area. Um, and what it does is if you're driving and someone calls you and you have the app, the app automatically pops up and you get to download a picture of, on your app of whatever is most important to you from a family perspective, whether it be your spouse or your children or grandchildren or friends or whatever, and the app pops up with that picture and says um, they can wait, the call can wait. And what we do is um, we partnered with businesses um, in the local areas that they join in, and what they do is you gain points based upon miles driven without being interrupted by text messaging um, or phone calls, you achieve points and you trade those points in at the different places of business, whether it be Carabas, whether it be um, uh, the juice, one of the juice bars, um, Chick-fil-A, um, all different types of restaurants and stuff. So um, you can use your app and go in and buy a sandwich or whatever and not have to pay for it. You have enough points. And so we engaged in that because we were starting to see um, over the years of my flying on the helicopters, when I first started flying in the 80s, I was actually quite shocked at the amount of um, driving while under the substance, while under in the influence. And um, it was quite bothersome. And um, as laws changed in the state, and we started putting up task forces on major holidays, such as New Year's and Fourth of July, Memorial Day, and doing these checks for the Department of Public Safety would do these checks, breathalyzer checks, um, to try to stop some of the um, driving while under the influence. And then with the addition of Uber and Lyft and communities have um, contracted with some of these um, uh, ride share programs where after a certain hour at night, you can call them if you're intoxicated or under the influence and they'll take you home and you don't even have to pay in some of the communities. But um, the concern was as we continue with the social media piece and the um, arrival of cell phones and everyone being on their phone and texting and driving. Um, we started seeing an impact of less while driving under the influence and more from distracted driving. Where they were looking down at their phone or trying to read a text and looked up and ran into someone or ran over someone or ran off the road. Um, and so We've really been working with our partners from the Safe to Save app. We now have over, even the latest was over 100,000 people that have downloaded in the Houston metropolitan area. So, and we continue to try to get the word out. So that's really when I think of, you know, um, zero, it's to stop some of this unnecessary tragedies that happen due to people not being focused and paying attention while driving. Um, and especially trying to get this out, we've met and gotten it out to a lot of the high schools where we have our young drivers starting to drive and can easily be distracted and don't understand some of those consequences. Um, so that's really where we come in um, because of the amount of um, injuries. And some of these injuries are life-changing for people and some are um, where we've had fatalities, obviously. And under the intoxication piece, what was surprising over the years 
was typically what we came across was the intoxicated individual typically wasn't, they may have been injured, but it was more minor injuries. The people that they hit who were not intoxicated typically had the most severe injuries and obviously many times resulted in death. And so we're seeing the same thing with the distracted driving. Um, so that's really where we came into all of this was, you know, as a trauma center, and we are the busiest in the nation, Memorial Hermann's Level 1 Trauma Center is the busiest trauma center in the country. Um, we really have a passion to work with our communities to help decrease some of this and get ed- people educated and understanding what the consequences are. Does that make yeah. sense? So what caught me is um, a few things about what you're saying. We're seeing that in in the data that we've looked at, too, is um, what some of the leading causes are, are impairment and distracted driving. And, you know, you mentioned zero to get there. Um, are there, in addition to that and to ending traffic deaths, are there uh, other benefits in addition to safety? Um, I'm going to repeat that question under other what? I'm sorry. Sure. So, you know, um, Vision Zero would end traffic deaths and serious injuries. In addition okay. to that, um, you know, what are the un- other benefits? And well, if you want to think about it, too, from it would a, certainly, your health perspective. It would certainly decrease health care costs, um, obviously, as these people, as um patients come in with these injuries, you know, it's not trauma. When you look at trauma, it starts in the pre-hospital setting. And trauma is defined as all the way through rehabilitation to getting the person back to um, society in a functional manner. And so the costs associated with that are continuing to become astronomical and can be extremely financial devastating for families. Um, And that's just from the financial piece. The other piece to this is, you know, the impact of trauma, and I'll just, I'm going to put this out there and certainly not meant for um, any digression, but, um, you know, someone has heart disease and someone has cancer, um, Typically, you're diagnosed and you have a treatment plan and you work through that treatment plan and sometimes the treatments are successful and sometimes they're not. And so where I'm going with this is families understand that, um, you know, the, the treatment hasn't been working. They don't have a treatment. You just progressively get worse until you transition out of this world. With trauma... Um, it would be you leave the house this morning to go to work, and the next thing you know, you're getting a phone call from the local trauma center asking if you have a family member by this name, and you say yes, and you tell them who you are, that you need to come to the trauma center because there's been an accident, and they've been involved and have been airlifted to us. And so your whole world and the whole family dynamic is totally changed at that point. Totally unexpected, totally unprepared for it, and um, that begins the whole trauma experience. And um, a good portion of trauma patients, after they've um, gotten through the acute side of their health care for trauma, they end up having to go to rehabilitation for continuing rehab to be able to get them back um, into a functional state in society. Some of these patients, I've had patients that, um, you know, they're healthy, walking, talking, life is great, and when in a moment's notice, they're left a paraplegic or quadriplegic. And if they're 18 years old, they're 23 years old, they're 32 years old, married with children, it's like the whole family unit is totally disrupted and is going to be this way for the remainder of that individual's life. And so many times you see where families um, start falling apart um, from a family perspective 
and these all these other cascading events that take place that disrupt the family because of the trauma. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I think um, you're bringing up a lot of really important components that um, the traffic crashes, especially when they're severe or when there's loss of life, impact so many people, friends and family, and the cost on our system. Um, and that is, you know, really um, part of that Vision Zero strategy and thinking about this as a public health issue. Um, yeah, what you're saying really resonates with the uh, Vision Zero strategy. So I really appreciate your perspective. I do want to. Well, it's not. It's not just the healthcare costs. That's one component. You've now disrupted, if it's the breadwinner for the family, now you've disrupted their earning income and earning potential and the future of their earning potential, right? Especially if they've had a severe brain and, uh, head injury, okay? They may never be able to go back to being who they were professionally. Um, to continue to support their families financially, right? And so it, it hits that whole gamut of the not just the healthcare side and the public side, but also from their own personal belief. And then we end up with it, it rolls over to the public side because then you're trying to garner state or federal aid to support these folks, whether it be through Social Security, disability, Medicaid at the state level, et cetera. So it does really do a 360-degree impact, Yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so I want to, um, I could keep asking you questions, but I really want to open it up and see what people are commenting, if there are questions for you from um, other folks, if people want to unmute themselves if you're dialing in and ask uh, Tom any questions or any questions in general about uh, Vision Zero. Now is the time to do so. Um, so I guess first I'll call on uh, Pete or Jennifer if you want to just report out what people may be commenting in the chat or if there are questions for um, Tom. So this is Peter. Uh, we actually don't have anything in the chat directly for Tom, um, but if there are others um, who are viewing or listening in, um, I suppose feel free to speak up. Thanks, Pete. And I think Tom gave us so much good material just to, from his uh, Q&A. Uh, I started seeing people start to type and then delete it, so I think he is answering things as we went. <laughs> we really appreciate him joining us. Yes. Um, Tom, I think we'll, um, if you want to stick around for a little bit, if any questions pop up, feel free. Um, we want to point people to a few other ways that they can provide us with feedback, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Or, uh, Brian, do you want to... Um, can you guys hear me? Or? Do you want to take the lead on that and, and tell us where we're at with pledges and the map? Uh, sure, Hello? but before I start, it looks like somebody just unmuted themselves to uh, give some feedback. Oh, okay. Hey, I'm sorry for interrupting. I just wanted to uh, uh, ask Tom a quick question. Um, uh, my name is Zoe Fafiz. I'm a physician as well, um, and um, work at Memorial Hammond as well. And I just wanted to ask, uh, Tom, you know, I know that we all see inside the hospital how much these very preventable act, uh, crashes destroy lives, um, probably generationally. Like we, I'm a pediatrician, we see the health effects of children, uh, both who are impacted by the crash physically and also psychologically. And we see how long that lasts and it potentially lasts generations. I mean, the effects probably out, outlive us. Um, do you have any recommendations on getting other nurses, physicians, uh, healthcare workers who see this on a day to day level and um, sort of advocate for them to start thinking outside of just the four walls of the hospital and onto, you know, the streets in their community, um, the crosswalks in their community and sort of uh, get the ball rolling in terms of a more holistic sort of public health standpoint? Sure. I think that's a great question, number one. Um, 
couple of things I just want to share is um, two issues. One is, yes, they can certainly reach out through the Level 1 Trauma Center, and if they're not working at Memorial Hermann, they certainly can look at their own um, health care facility if it's a designated trauma center. But I would recommend that they get with the outreach prevention folks like at our level one and our level two trauma centers, and they support the entire system from an injury prevention aspect. And the lead on that is Sarah Beth Abbott, and she really does a phenomenal job of, we do programs all over the community of um, for different age groups, for different schools, church groups, in bringing things to them. We have a um, driver simulation where you can put the person behind the driver's wheel and we um, augment different levels of impairment of what it would look like when they're driving and they're trying to drive the car. Um, We partner with Houston Fire Department on that and do that. Uh, We do the Live Your Dreams project um, and that's pretty impactful. So there's ways. They just need to reach out, hopefully, to our outreach prevention folks um, through, like at Memorial Hermann, through us, and get connected. The second piece to that I just want to share with you is, um, as a trauma nurse myself, when I worked in the emergency department and when I flew on the helicopter, it gets very frustrating, to your point. I can I can give you countless stories of when I arrived back at the trauma at at Herman with the helicopter and took the patient to the emergency department then had to meet with their family to explain what was going on, spent many a times in tears and having to pull yourself together, right, emotionally as the caregiver. And we see it with our physicians and we see it with our nursing staff. And so part of the problem sometimes is they are so emotionally drained at the end of their shift that they don't really have a whole lot of energy to give at that point or to go, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's trying to, how do we get to them to explain sometimes the best way to work through some of that grief that you're dealing with is trying to, to go back and teach and get out there and give back from a preventive method but many of our, our staff, it was like, look, I don't even have the energy of the time. By the time I finish my, my rotation, I'm like exhausted emotionally and mentally. So we've got, that's an area we've got to continue to try to work on and how do we get those folks back engaged versus just being the caretaker when they hit the door. Does that make sense? I don't know if I answered your question. Yes, sorry, I muted myself. Yes, it makes sense. Um, and I'm sure if you're a physician, you've probably seen it in your career as well. I don't know, uh, I didn't hear what type of physician you are, but with our trauma surgeons and our emergency department physicians and our rehab physicians, um, we do have um, psycho, uh, psycho services, psychological services for the trauma patients now tied into our service line And we have a trauma network, a survivor's network that we provide for the survivors, both the families as well as the patients themselves, to um, for group activity and group therapy. Because to your earlier point, the impact is typically a lifelong impact for those families and um, for generations. Um, It just you know goes on. So um, that's what I would recommend: is they reach out. Every trauma center has to have an outreach program. If you're designated by the state or verified by the American College of Surgeons, you are required to have an outreach prevention program. And so when they come through every three years to redesignate or revalidate, you have to demonstrate and show what you've done over those three years, what communities, what people you impacted, how many, the dates, the courses, all of that. So there, it's happening it's just probably not widely publicized, so we probably need to do a better job at that. But for Memorial Hermann, I recommend Sarah Beth Abbott. Thank you. I already I work with Sarah with the uh, Injury Free Coalition, so I can attest to how great she is. Okay, great. She's she's uh, phenomenal at what she does. She does such great work. It's unbelievable. We're very fortunate to have her. 
And, and I'll just jump in here really quickly um, for um, the person who uh, asked the question. Uh, Sarah Beth Abbott did post in the chat her um, email address where she can be reached. Um, and um, I'm not sure if you have access to the chat, but um, you can reach out to us and we can be sure to connect you with, with her uh, contact information. Um, any other questions? Um, <clears throat> That's why I don't really get invited to parties because that can really be the dampening of the spirit. So it's not surprising you're not having questions. <laughs> um, Thank you, Tom, so much for joining us. I, this was really, really informative, and um, and we so appreciate you joining us and hope that we can continue to work with you um, on this effort. And if there are no other questions, um, OK, great. Thank you. We already worked together. There's a comment in there that you already worked together at the Injury Free Coalition for Kids. OK, awesome. Um, well, and again, thank you for having us, and we'll continue to work with you and continue to work, um, work with Sarah Beth Abbott to connect us, um, but we're certainly here to help, and that's really been our mission is to decrease these crashes. You know, the ultimate, the gold standard would be to get to zero. Um, I'm optimistic, but uh, definitely can have an impact to decrease, and if we just save one person from something like this or one family, we've made a difference, but imagine what we could do if we could say a whole lot more. So um, again, we appreciate you taking the time and inviting us, and we look forward to continuing to work with you all. On your Thank business. you so much, Tom. We really appreciate it. We'll definitely look forward to working with you. Okay. Well, thank you and have a good evening. And be yeah, safe. you too. Okay. Bye-bye. Well, Bye-bye.